My name is Dr. Ahmad Ombran. I am a staff cardiologist in the Department of Anesthesia and Pain Management, Toronto General Hospital, UHN, University of Toronto. And this is a lecture about echocardiographic assessment of prosthetic valves. This lecture is for a cardiac anesthesia fellows. In this lecture, I'm going to use a couple of guidelines by American Society of Echo and Society of Cardiac Anesthesia. The first guideline was uh, published in 2009. Recommendation for evaluation of prosthetic valves is echocardiography and Doppler ultrasound. This is a little bit old guideline for assessment of prosthetic valve, uh, but nothing changed compared to that time. And this is a 2020 guideline, again by American Society of Echo and Society of Cardiovascular Anesthesia. Uh, this is a guideline for the use of transesophageal echocardiography to assist with surgical decision making in the operating room. This is mainly a, a guideline about the decision making in the OR. And the last guideline, that's a 2020 guideline, American College of Cardiology and American Heart Association guideline for the management of patients with valvular heart disease. The first valve replacement surgery was done in 1962. That was after the time that uh, cardiopulmonary bypass pump was invented. That was 1952. Approximately 90,000 valve substitutes are now implanted in the US. So in Canada, it will be about 9,000. And 280,000 worldwide each year. Despite the market improvement in prosthetic valve design and surgical procedures over the past decades, valve replacement does not provide a definite cure to the patient. Instead, native valve disease is traded for prosthetic valve disease. So we are changing one disease to another disease. Outcome of patients undergoing valve replacement is affected by prosthetic valve hemodynamics, durability, and thrombogenicity. Many of the prosthesis related complications can be prevented or their impact minimized through optimal prosthesis selection in the individual patient and careful medical management or follow-up after the implantation. Echocardiography plays a major role in follow-up of these patients. The type of prosthetic heart valves, we have several times uh, type of the valves, and I'm talking about most of the valves that we are using in North America. The biologic valve can be stented with a porcine xenograft, pericardial xenograft, a stentless valve, porcine xenograft, pericardial xenograft, and homograft or allograft, autograft, and percutaneous valves that are coming and coming. Mechanical valve, bileaflet valve, that is more common, single tilted disc valve, that was popular in 1980 and after, now we don't use it usually, and caged ball valve, or a star Edward valve, that was probably the first successful mechanical valve that was invented. We have to talk about a couple of terminology. Stented valves, when we say stented valves, consist of a radio pack or radiolucent base ring or a stent frame covered by a suture cuff from which three stent posts or struts rise to support the valve. A stentless valve use Dacron clothes or porcine aortic root as support instead of a stent. Stentless valves provide increased effective orifice area 
and lower transvalvular gradient compared to the stented valves, but their durability is in question. This example of the stented valve or magna valve, for example, this is swing ring and this is the start of the valve that supports the leaflet. And the swing ring by the suture will be sued to the uh, annulus of the patient. This is an example of Toronto stentless valve or SPV uh, that was uh, manufactured by St. Jude, and this valve was invented by David in Toronto. It was a popular valve in 1990 to almost 2000, uh, but in a long-term run, it was clear that after seven years or eight years, the valve deteriorated, now is out of the market. And this is another stainless valve. This is not the valve, it's a root actually, it's a porcine root or free style. A route that is made by Metronic and rarely these days again we use it. When we talk about the xenograft, a tissue graft or organ transplant from a donor of a different species. Xenograft valves are porcine, like a pig valve, or bovine pericardial valves used for human being valve replacement. Allograft or homograft a tissue graft from a donor of the same species as the recipient, but not genetically identical. Aortic homograft and pulmonary homograft from human cadaver are used for aortic and pulmonic root replacement in cardiac surgery and still are in use. Autograft, a graft of tissue from one point to another of the same individual's body. In Ross operation, for example, pulmonic valve or autograft is uh, taken and replaced the diseased aortic valve of the same person, so that is called valve switch or Ross operation. Prosthetic valve sizes. Prosthetic valve sizes are stated by manufacturer companies are based on outer dimension of the prosthetic valves or materials. Prosthetic valve size are expressed by odd number, like 21, 23, 25. All prosthetic ring size, dacron tube, homograft, and percutaneous valves are expressed by even number, like size 26, 28, 30. These are some of the valves, like a ball cage valve or started with valve. There's a ball inside the cage. There was a disc and cage as well that is, is disappeared for a short time. This is a metronic hall tilting disc valve, and this is a Bukshire valve. Bukshire valve, there was a problem in terms of the uh, anchor of the valve and the disc that was broken sometimes, but otherwise it was a good valve sometimes. Uh, there are mechanical double disc valves. These are the common valves that we are using these days. St. Jude mechanical valve is very popular. Carbomedics mechanical valve and Onyx valve. Onyx valve for aortic and mitral are a different design, especially for aortic position. If we use an Onyx mechanical valve, we don't use a high dose of comodine or we can use other substitutes. Biopositic porcine valves, Hancock two biopositic valve that is made by Metronic Company. Hancock was first implanted, Hancock two especially, first implanted in 1982 by Dr. David in Toronto, and is very popular valve in our center. Metronic mosaic valve is a porcine valve, is a biopositic valve. This metronic mosaic valve by a one very big meta-analysis study this is the best valve for mitral valve replacement. Uh, epic valve in the mitral position has a short strut, and if you are worried about the LVUT obstruction after mitral valve replacement, because this is a short uh, profile, we can use it for mitral valve replacement in a patient that there is a risk of 
LVT obstruction. Fibrosic bovine pericardial valves, again the famous one is Carpentier valve, different type of Carpentier valve, Magna, Magna E's. This is a very popular valve in Europe and even in North America. Metonic Evolus valve is a pericardium, is made by a Metonic company, and we use it in our center here. Surin mitral flu was a very good valve sometimes, like a five, ten years ago, but uh, disappeared from the market because it was deteriorating quickly after two, three years. St. Jude trifecta valve, again, it was a pericardial valve and now is out of the market. So these two valve, mitral flow and trifecta are out of the market. These two valve, magna and evolus, we are using now. Socialist biopositive valves, this is a, like a competitor for TAVI valves. Uh, they don't need suture, so implantation is very fast, especially in high risk patient that you want to class column time be lower, less, we can use it. It's a self expandable valve, first valve is called Perceval, made by Surin Company, it doesn't need any suture, it's a self expandable, it's approved in Europe, it's not approved in North America. Edward's intuitive valve. That's a balloon expandable and need only three suture. And Metronix 3F enable valve uh, that was popular five, six years ago, but now is out of the market. One of the problem is this valve is very long and because of the effect of pressure recovery, when we do a Doppler gradient across this valve, we might overestimate the valve gradient. For example, if you call it valve grade and peak 40 or 50, in reality is less than that, maybe 30. Percutaneous valves or TAVI or TAVER valves, uh, this is made by Metone company, it's called Core Valve, and this is by Edward company, it's called Edward Sapien Valve, and now the Generation 3 or Sapien 3 is in the market. And this is a melody valve made mainly for pulmonic valve replacement. Aortic and pulmonary homograft, these are homograft, so these are taken from the cadaver, human being. Aortic homograft is a tube and pulmonary homograft. Pulmonary homograft, now we use it for uh, during the Ross operation for reconstruction of the RVUT. Aortic homograft uh, is not available very well and rarely we use it. What about aneuploplasty ring? There are many rings available now in the market. Uh, the most famous one is a Carpentier ring. That is a Physio 1 and Physio 2. These are rigid or semi-rigid ring. Kasgarov ring is a half a ring, and again, it's a semi-rigid. Uh, you can call it Kasgarov ring or band. It's only posterior, and this is for tricuspid. And this is a simplicity band. This band was invented by Dr. David. Now it's manufactured by Metonic Company, and it's not a ring. It's just a band for analyplasty of the mitral and tricuspid, and in our center, for mitral valve repair and tricuspid valve repair, this is uh, mostly used. There are some other way of repairing the valve, like a mitral clip or tricuspid valve clip. That is again for a special group of the MR and TR, and uh, we should talk about this in a separate lecture. What about uh, criteria to selection the valve. So, for patient above age 65, uh, we use biopositive valve. Uh, so, uh, doesn't matter is a mitral or aortic position. 65 is a cutoff in North America to use the biopositive valve, and 50 is the cutoff for mechanical valve. So, below 50. We should put mechanical valve for aorta and for mitral position, 
and above 65 for sure biopsy valve between 50 and 65 we make a decision based on the individual and is a shared decision even for all type of valve the decision and preference of the patient is very important so in a patient above 65 age uh, it's better to use a biopsy valve for aortic and below as i said and in a patient below age 50 who prefer a biopsic AVR and have appropriate anatomy, replacement of the aortic valve by a pulmonic autograft or ROS procedure may be considered. Okay, is it 2B? And uh, uh, it should be done at the comprehensive valve center or center of excellence for valve replacement. Uh, like our center and we have many cases now uh, uh, for ROS operation in European guideline ROS operation is not there also the ROS operation came from UK from Mr. Ross but now is not part of the guideline in European guideline so this is the algorithm for valve replacement and selection of the valve what about complications of prosthetic valves? Patient prosthesis mismatch is one of the complications. Geometric mismatch, like when we move the pulmonic valve to the aortic position, they should match together. If it's not matching, we call it geometric mismatch. The hesence of the valve uh, is one of the complications. Usually early dehiscence is because of the technical problem. Late dehiscence is because of the endocarditis. Primary failure of the valve, uh, sometimes the valve will fail quickly, even less than one year, especially biopersic valve. Thrombosis and thrombogenicity, it depends on the patient, to the host as well. Panus formation, usually panus is a, will develop in a long run, like more than five years, but sometimes you see the panus formation in aorta or mitral very uh, sooner like two, three years, we had a case last week for this. Uh, panus in aortic position is more than a mitral position. Soda aneurysm formation, endocarditis, and hemolysis. All of this can happen in a patient that had a valve replacement. So for panus, especially, I want to emphasize that in aortic valve is more than mitral valve, but degeneration of the valve in mitral position is more than aorta. Patient prosthesis mismatch. What does it mean? Patient prosthesis mismatch is present when the effective orifice area of the inserted prosthetic valve is too small in relation to body size. Its main hemodynamic consequences is to generate higher than expected patients' uh, the gradients so normally functioning prosthetic valve so gradient is high but the function of the valve is good parameters used to characterize patient prosthetic mismatch is effective orifice area indexed to the patient's body surface area patient prosthetic mismatch is considered to be hemodynamically insignificant if the index valve area is more than 0.85 centimeter square per meter square is moderate if it's between 85 and 65 and is severe if it's less than 0 0.65 centimeter per meter square that is for aortic position prevalence of severe patient prosthesis mismatch is about 2 to 11 percent in aortic position again is more common and in mitral position is less common because in aortic position surgeon has to put the valve in the size of the annulus in mitral position usually mitral annulus is dilated if somebody has a mr so there's not much a uh, limitation this is an example of a patient has a mechanical uh, aortic valve and develop panus formation and uh, this is a valve when is extracted this is a panus so in 
aortic position the panus will develop both side but more in lvt side in mitral position panus will develop in la side so the evaluation of uh, prosthetic aortic valve Doppler echocardiographic evaluation of prosthetic aortic valve. This is based on the guideline of American Society of Echo that was published in 2009. So Doppler echocardiography of the valve, we should measure the peak velocity and the gradient, mean gradient. We should look at the contour of the jet velocity and acceleration time, and we should use Doppler velocity index. This Doppler velocity index for aortic position used to be called a dimensionless index. So we call it Doppler velocity index. Effective orifice area, presence, location, and severity of the regurgitation. And we should look at the chambers as well, like LV size, function, and hypertrophy. This is an example of a normal aortic valve Doppler an obstructed aortic valve Doppler. In normal aortic valve Doppler, we see the mean gradient is 22 millimeter mercury. Doppler velocity index is 0.4, that is okay. And acceleration time is 75 millisecond. Acceleration time is the beginning of the aortic click to the peak of the aortic Doppler. Overall, this Doppler of the normal aortic valve, doesn't matter, is a bio or mechanical, is a triangular shape. It means fast, going down, and this way, it's triangular. In obstructed valve, this Doppler is parabolic. It's not triangular, it's a parabolic shape. So acceleration time increased and ejection time increased. So acceleration time in this case is 180 millisecond and mean gradient is 80 millimeter mercury and Doppler velocity index is 0 0.18 and I will show you the numbers that is normal. So that's a way to calculate the acceleration time and the ratio of acceleration time to the ejection time that I will show you later. This is how to measure the LVT to measure the aortic annulus di diameter to be used for continuity equation. So we can use the uh, annulus di diameter dimension just below the valve at the junction of the valve and the tissue of the septum or anterior mitral leaflet. The Doppler velocity index. It means the velocity of the LVUT to the velocity of the jet of the across the aortic valve. So this velocity to this velocity. This is not dependent to any other measurement. So it's a very simple one, and we call it Doppler velocity index. This is a phenomenon is called pressure recovery. So I would like to talk about this a little bit. What does mean pressure recovery? Look at this tube. This is the LVUT, and this is the aorta, and here is the valve. As a matter, biopsic valve or mechanical valve. So when the flow is here, the velocity is not high, okay, but the pressure is high. When it reached to the across the valve, the velocity increase, but pressure will drop. So, because the pressure and velocity they have an inverse relation. Then after the valve, when the flow goes, gradually the velocity will decrease and pressure will increase. That's the reason that we call it pressure recovery. It means pressure will recover. Pressure here is very low. Here, recover to the baseline. So it's called pressure recovery. So when we measure the gradient by the Doppler, we are measuring the gradient just at the across the valve, just here. 
when we are measuring the gradient by catheter, we are measuring gradient between here and here. So the pressure difference between LV and this point by catheter for sure is less than a gradient or pressure difference that we measure at this point. So always Doppler measurement of the gradient is more than cat measurement of the gradient. That is because of the pressure recovery. This pressure recovery happens more if the aorta is narrow and happens less if the aorta is dilated. So if you have a dilated aorta, pressure recovery is not happening too much. So it means the cat gradient and Doppler gradient are very similar to each other. But if you have a narrow aorta, because of the pressure recovery, the Doppler gradient is more than cat gradient. So assume somebody had a aortic valve replacement and replacement of the AC in the aorta. If the AC in the aorta replacement, the dacron is less than 30 millimeter or three centimeter, that pressure recovery happens and overestimation of the gradient by Doppler will happen. That's the reason that anytime we have a, a bental operation, mechanical valve and the Doppler tube, when we measure the gradient by Doppler, we might overestimate it. So you have to be careful. Sometimes you might get a very high gradient, a surgeon might put a catheter here and cut the aorta and say, oh, there's no gradient. So both of us, we are, we are right. We are measuring the gradient at the level of the valve, and they are measuring the gradient at the, between LV and the far away from the valve in AC in the aorta. This phenomenon of pressure recovery happens when we have a mechanical valve as well, but is more than bioprostic valve because the orifice at the middle has a higher velocity. So we have a higher velocity, we have a more pressure recovery. So when we measure the mean gradient, peak gradient across the mechanical valve, if our cursor line is crossing at the middle orifice or central orifice, we might overestimate the gradient. That's the reason that we should put the cursor in a different area and take an average of this gradient. The Doppler parameter of prosthetic aortic valve function in mechanical and stented bioporosic valve, if the velocity is less than 3 meter per second, that's normal, more than 4 is severely stenotic, mean gradient less than 20 is normal, more than 35 is significantly stenotic, Doppler velocity index less than 0 0.30 is, more than 0 0.30 is normal, less than 0 0.25 is severely stenotic. Effective orifice area is centimeter square. More than 1.2 is normal. Less than 0 0.8 is severely stenotic in adult patient. Contour of the jet velocity through the prosthetic aortic valve. Triangular is normal. Rounded, symmetrical, or parabolic is abnormal. Acceleration time less than 80 millisecond is normal, more than 100 millisecond is significantly obstructed. So 80 and 100. Now look at this algorithm. Sometimes the gradient is high, but the valve function is normal. So if we have a velocity more than three meter per second, across the aortic valve, doesn't matter by transtrinsic or by T. We take the Doppler velocity index, more than 30, 25 to 30, and less than 0 0.25. If the Doppler, if the velocity is more than 3, and Doppler velocity index is more than 0 0.30, we look at the jet contour. If the jet contour is parabolic and is more than 100, probably the valve is stenotic. If it's less than 100, valve is not stenotic, but the gradient is high because it's patient process mismatch 
or high cardiac output state. If the Doppler velocity index is less than 0.25, again, if it's a parabolic, the valve is stenotic. If it's not parabolic, it's a triangular shape, acceleration time is less than 100, it means the LVUT velocity is not a proper. It means the LVUT velocity, the sample volume for LVUT is not in right place. So it is, uh, it is far away from the valve. For evaluation of severity of prosthetic aortic valve regurgitation, this is all criteria is very similar to the assessment of regurgitation in native valve, and I'm not going to repeat it. Evaluation of prosthetic mitral valve. Prosthetic mitral valve in terms of regurgitation in transthoracic, the mitral regurgitation, if the valve is mechanical, it might be covered by mechanical valve shadow. So we might not see the regurgitation in LA. That's the reason that T is better and we'll show it. So again, what's the criteria to see the mitral valve is stenotic? We look at the E wave velocity of the mitral inflow. If the E wave velocity is more than 1.9, like in this case is 2.2. If the VTI in this case is 42, and mean gradient is 7 millimeter mercury. So this valve is likely stenotic. So then we go for LVT VTI, and we use this ratio. So the VTI of prosthetic valve to the VTI of aortic valve, if it's more than 2.2, that mitral valve is stenotic. And I will show you in next slide. So parameter that we use for prosthetic valve uh, dysfunction in the mitral position, peak early velocity, as I said, more than 1.9 is abnormal, mean gradient, we have to look at the heart rate as well, pressure half time, we can use it for prosthetic mitral valve, not for valve area, just the number of the pressure half time is important. Doppler velocity index, ratio of the Doppler velocity TV, VTI of prosthetic valve to the LVUT, effective or if it's area, we can measure it, presence, location, and severity of regurgitation, and other chamber, LV size and function, LA size, RV size, and pulmonary artery pressure are important. These are two examples of the two valve. This is a normal prosthetic mitral valve, E wave velocity is 1.1. If it's less than 1.9, I said it's normal. Mean gradient is 4. Usually, mean gradient less than 5 or 6 is normal. Pressure half time is 123. So, pressure half time uh, less than 120 is totally normal. This valve is stenotic. E wave velocity is 2.5, is very high. Mean gradient is 15, very high and pressure half time is high, so this valve is stenotic, this valve is normal. So this is criteria to assessment of prosthetic mitral valve stenosis. E wave velocity more than one point, less than 1.9 is normal, more than 2.5 is very abnormal, mean gradient 5 and 10, ratio less than 2.2 is normal, more than 2.5 is very abnormal, Effective orifice area, more than two is normal, less than one is very abnormal. Pressure half time, 130, not 120, I said. 130 is normal, and more than 200 is very abnormal. So these are the number that for assessment of prosthetic mitral valve stenosis, you should measure it. For regurgitation, is very similar to the stenosis. Again, we use the E wave velocity, uh, the ratio of the VTI, mean gradient, TR velocity, if somebody has a mitral regurgitation, TR velocity goes up, 
and the stroke volume calculated by Doppler and by 2D your big difference as systolic flow conversions might be seen. Echocardiography and Doppler cardiography for stability of prosthetic MR using findings from TTE and TE. This is the whole uh, criteria that you can read it. And these are the ones that we should remember always. The area of the MR to the area of the LA, uh, flow convergence, and the shape of the uh, mitral inflow. Evaluation of prosthetic pulmonic valves. Again, it's very similar to aortic valve, so peak velocity and peak gradient is important. Mean gradient, Doppler velocity index, effective orifice area, presence, location, and severity of regurgitation. Some of these criteria are not very validated. Related cardiac chamber or V size, function, and hypertrophy. So the one that we use mainly is the peak gradient and mean gradient. Uh, finding suspicious for prosthetic valve stenosis, cusp or lifted sickening, narrowing of forward flow, peak velocity more than 3 meter uh, in a prosthetic valve and more than 2 meter in homograft, increase in peak velocity on serial studies, that's very important. Impaired RV function. So the peak velocity is the most important one in assessment of prostatic pulmonic valve dysfunction. For pulmonic regurgitation, again, the criteria are uh, a little bit similar to the aortic regurgitation, but some number are different. And uh, like pressure half time, for example, less than 200 uh, millisecond in AI is severe. In pulmonic regurgitation, less than 100 is severe. Tricuspid valve, uh, again, is very similar to the mitral valve. Peak early velocity is important. Mean gradient and pressure half time and the ratio. This is an example of the case with a prosthetic tricuspid valve stenosis. You can see the turbulence here, and you can see the mean gradient is high. So the peak velocity more than 1.7 meter per second is abnormal for tricuspid valve, uh, prosthetic valve. Mean gradient more than 6 is compatible with severe TS. Pressure half time more than 230 milliseconds is compatible with a significant stenosis and uh, effective orifice area and the ratio are not very validated. So these three are important. Uh, for tricuspid regurgitation, again all of you know it, uh, the jet area, it is the most important part that we use it and uh, vena contractor. So jet area, vena contractor. What about the guideline of T guideline in the OR, interop T guideline? A couple of issues, almost we reviewed all of this. But for aortic valve replacement, for example, uh, in the OR assessment of prosthetic valve in the aortic position, uh, we should identification of the sewing ring and evaluation of the proper functioning of the valve leaflet is important. Exclusion of presence of pathologic regurgitation, intra or paravalvular, and establishment of the hemodynamic profile of the newly implanted valve. Uh, evaluation of prosthetic valves in the aortic position includes several view at the mid-esophageal transgastric view. The entire circumference of the sewing ring should be visualized in short axis view and the measured gradient of an aortic valve prosthesis depends on the ventricular contractility, loading condition, and type and size and location of the prosthesis. 
immediately following implantation, the prosthetic valve should be evaluated for pathologic regurgitation. Intravalvar regurgitation is a common finding in normally functioning bioprosthetic valve 10% of time and is often seen as a small central or commissural AI, especially pericardial valves that we see every day in the OR. Mechanical valves have a specific pattern of washing jet that minimize blood stasis in the hinge mechanism, preventing thrombus formation. These washing jets are seen within the swing ring, occur early during valve closure, and are of short duration and length. Simultaneous multiplane imaging permits easier identification and characterization of these jets. Regurgitant jet features that may suggest more than mild regurgitation include wide jet origin, multiple jet, jet path that is visible around the stent or swing ring, and a visible proximal flow convergence. These are all criteria shows that the uh, regurgitant is significant. The ACE guideline does not recommend the use of jet length or jet area for prosthetic valve to assess the degree of regurgitation. Values of quantitative indices that may indicate significant valve obstruction include the peak aortic process less than more than 3 meter, is abnormal, in the presence of an elevated acceleration time more than 100, and low Doppler velocity index less than 0.27, is abnormal, and acceleration time to ejection time more than 0.4, is also consistent with prosthetic valve obstruction. This is mainly in the American Society guideline. It did not come in 2020 guideline. As patient prosthesis mismatch can lead to diminished LV mass regression and poor long-term outcome after aortic valve replacement, the effective orifice area of the newly implanted prosthetic valve should be calculated using the continuity equation the effective orifice area should be compared with other Doppler parameters for concordance and reasons for discordance. Mitral valve replacement. Uh, assessment of prosthetic valve in the mitral position by 2D and 3D. The intraop environment provides unique challenges for the assessment of prosthetic valve due to possible acute and frequent changes in hemodynamic. A prosthetic valve in the mitral position should be inspected for adequate functioning of the mechanical disc or bioprosthetic leaflets and the presence of intra or paravalvular leak. Adequate motion of the prosthetic valve disc can be examined after removal of the aortic cross clamp. Excursion of prosthetic valve disc leaflet may be limited by interposition of subvalvular tissue or in the presence of low flow across the valve in a partially filled LV. Comprehensive evaluation of prosthetic valve should be performed after complete separation from bypass. The entire swing ring of the mitral prosthesis should be imaged at the mid esophageal level by sweeping the multiplane angle from 0 to 180 degrees. Off-axis view sometimes is needed. Color flow Doppler should be used to locate abnormal intra and paraprosthetic flow. The normal washing jets of mechanical prosthetic valve should be identified and differentiated from pathologic regurgitation. By providing an fast view of the mitral valve, CD echocardiography with or without color can evaluate the location and characteristic of the paravalvular regurgitation. Immobile leaflets in the presence of adequate loading condition and moderate or severe paravalvular leak should trigger surgical intervention, while the management of a mild paravalvular leak is controversial and can be uh, left from the OR. The decision for immediate correction requires a team approach between imaging, cardiac anesthesia, and the cardiac surgeon 
should be tailored to each patient and clinical situation and the weight against the risk of prolonged surgery if the LV function is not good. Harmonic valve replacement, uh, again, we should check it for PS and PR. And for tricuspid, the same, we should check the gradient and any paravalvular leak. So now I'm going to show you a couple of case example, very short. This is a patient that had a mechanical mitral valve replacement. As you see, the two discs are anti-anatomic because anatomic anterior disc should open this, posterior should this. So this anti-anatomic position of the mechanical mitral valve. This valve has a small paravalvular leak as arrow is showing. And when you do 3D, you see it. Always try to get the 3D of the mitral valve. It's a little bit aortic valve that you can say from where the leak is coming. Early paravalvular leak is common, and if it's less than mild, we just leave it. This is another case with aortic valve replacement, biopositic valve. You see a leak here. When you see a leak, also it's mild, but you have to say from where it's coming. You put the X plane. You see the leak is inside the swing ring and is mild and we left it. So this is seen mainly in pericardial valve. And this is a paper shows that the paravalvular leak or cough leak in magna valve is about 2% of all valves and we, we see it more in our center here. This is another patient that has a leak like this in the OR. We said, okay, this is a mild uh, leak. We can leave it. We left it and it was a transvalvular and next week the leak increased and main reason for increase was this calcification because the valve was sitting in the calcification after a couple of days the calcification will be absorbed a little bit and leak will be more so this leak increased and we had to bring the patient back to the OR so always be careful if the leak is more than mild in the OR we should not accept this was a case that we had to do a redo AVR the week after. This is another case that had a, a aortic valve replacement one year ago and now has a severe valve uh, leak. So this is really severe. And this patient had a redo AVR and no leak anymore. This is another case uh, underwent by AVR with root enlargement. You see there is a turbulence here, we should not have it, and we have a leak. This leak is more than mild. Two jets, so we should not accept it, but sometimes the surgeon are pushing us to accept it in the OR. The gradient was high, this patient came to ICU, the degree of the AR increased. And we took the patient back in three days to the OR. And what the surgeon inspected, they saw the patch that they put it for root enlargement was interfering with the function of the valve, and valve was leaking. This is another patient had the mitral valve repair, not replacement. But the Doppler gradient, you see these two shadows. I showed many of you in the OR that we take only the dense shadow. Uh, that is might have repair or replacement and this is one of the paper that shows that these two shadows mainly because of the effect of the Doppler uh, that we call it Doppler effect and we should always take the dense shadow. This is a patient that had a, a biopersive mitral valve there was a small like a paravalvular leak here but this patient came the year after and uh, it was not part of our leak it was actually the circumflex was 
damaged. So they had to coil the circumflex. And this is the reason. So if the patient has a, a right, a, a left dominant, the chance of damage to the circumflex is more than right dominant, because especially this area, the circumflex is very close to the this commissure and appendage is here. So during the appendage closure or during the valve repair and replacement damage to circumflex might happen. It's not very common, uh, but it can happen. And this is a paper. So this is the end of the talk. Thank you very much. And I will answer the question when we see each other in the class.